Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined by James English. James, welcome to Carthkin Park. Thanks for having me on again brother. It's an absolute pleasure, you came here via a wee walk up the hills. Yes. Keeping the, the head fresh. Mm-hmm. How are you dealing with the current situation? Yeah, I'm, I'm dealing with well, my life's still, nothing's really changed except the kids being off school but... I know people are saying to self-isolate, but I'm up the mountains myself. I need to keep fresh, because if I stay in the house, man, my head will do over time. My demons will start kicking in, so I need to keep busy. I had a, a really interesting discussion over the weekend, James, about somebody that I know who has suffered serious mental health issues, and there are concerns that over the next weeks and months, this is going to be critical for people like that. Anybody who's battled addiction, for example, James, any tips that you've got I mean you've already mentioned you've been out there exercising any other tips over the next few months how to combat these things I definitely you need to maybe start a wee bit of yoga or breathing techniques if they're telling you because I believe the place is still going to get into full lockdown where the only time you can maybe leave is to get food so if you've got kids in the house it, it can be tough especially with the everybody trying to keep entertained for me it's to breathing techniques if you're feeling stressed any anxiety get into the room do a wee bit of 10 minute breathing um, go on to YouTube, just look at people, just to quiet the mind and no overthink because this is testing times for people, not just through physical stress but emotional stress and then you've got the money worries where people can't afford to go to work, people can't work so there's a whole list of here and it's um, testing times but again I don't want to think about the negatives, I'll try and create the positives to keep striving forward and I'll face every bridge that I come to that is going to test my patience or test my mindset and Listen, the demons are always there for anybody to battle my addictions. I believe we all get mental health issues. I believe we're all struggling in some ways. Some people hide it better than others. Some people deal with it better than others. But I worry that the suicide rate might go higher because people, if you look at the supermarkets in Oupo, it's um, all the aisles are empty with alcohol. So mm-hmm. people are sitting in the house drinking, thinking it's just going to go away. But if you're in that house, man, your anxiety, your depression is going to hit you a hundred times worse. So people need to be very careful. What would you look out for for your loved ones, your friends, mm-hmm. James, in these hard times? What do you look out for as well? Make sure they're okay. Just phone them. Just make sure they've got enough food, especially my wee gran and stuff. Just make sure she's stopped up in food and just keep phoning them. Just make sure there's no symptoms there. Or, because, again, it's, it is worrying times, but, again, I can be a hypercontract. If I have a cough or a sneeze in the middle of the night, all of a sudden I'm fucking Googling coronavirus and, for you know, I'm dying. So be cautious. Yes, it's big. Yes, it's going to come harder for the UK. I believe we're the last ones to eventually get it. But you've got to take the positive. China's numbers have dropped massively. There's not many people getting the coronavirus now. So we need to try and, I don't know, man, it's, it's so tough. And like I say, I'm not a doctor, mate. So it's just to do what's right for you. Listen to some what other people are doing. I know everybody can go down the rabbit hole and look at the news. But if I look at that news, that just depresses me. Listen to Boris Johnson or listen to them all. Just talk a lot of shit in my eyes. So try and switch off the telly. Try and um, do a bit of work from home and prepare yourself because things are going to pick up again in the next three to four weeks. So don't wait till then to go back into normal habits. Prepare mm-hmm. yourself now. Plan more work. Educate. Read books. Listen to audio books. Just listen to your podcast, which I've also seen is in the top 20 in the UK, which is amazing, brother. So congratulations for that. I appreciate that, James. But again, I mean, talking about podcasts... Obviously, your your show has uh, gone on a meteoric rise, and we'll come back to that in a second, because obviously that's how I got to know yourself, and, and I've watched, I think, most episodes, listened to a lot of the episodes as well. You said something there very interesting, and it wasn't flippant. Boris Johnson talks a lot of shite. I mean, when you have been brought up to trust a news source and trust people who are running the country and running government, and they're telling you that everything will be fine as long as you just wash your hands, right? Mm-hmm. And then weeks later, it uh, dawns on them that they were completely wrong. Uh, but by that time, the virus has spread and it's out of control. So I think what will happen once we come out the other end of that is people will be far more likely not only to not trust your politicians that have led us down the garden path, but some of the media sources as well yeah. that's given them a platform. Yeah, I don't trust them anyway because with some of the guests that I've had on, like the likes of David Icke and the biggest conspiracy theorists in the world, so... For me, I don't trust politicians anyway, so I'll try and take things with a pinch of salt, what they're saying. Again, there's that many theories and what people are opinions against it. I know people are saying the virus. Listen, the virus hasn't started with somebody eating a bat. I had uh, Naked Martin on my podcast to eat his own shite, do you know what I mean? So 
<laughs> it ain't with somebody eating a bat and this virus is spread. I believe it's man-made. I believe that everything's set up by the government for a global catastrophe. And I believe that this is a chemical war, in my opinion. I believe that this isn't planes and bombs anymore. This is, again, there's a man called, I'll tell you the name just now, who I'm having on my podcast, called Barry Trower. It's, he's got an interesting interview on YouTube. Barry, who talks about the 5G effect, where the first antennas that went up from 5G, around a 100 mile radius, all the trees, all the wildlife all died. Mm -hmm. So the frequencies that are coming off 5G, in the first place they started 5G was actually China as well. Again, it's conspiracy theories, there's not 100% proof, but these are the kind of things that I, I can get into the rabbit hole and believe in it as a possibility. This ain't started from somebody eating a bat. There's no way that, there's people eat crazy shit every day. So again, I believe all these things are man-made, I believe that. But I also believe there's a cure for everything as well. So, But is this a, a, just a business, a trillion dollar business that they're trying to create a cure where people need to get vaccinated for, where it causes, makes money for them. So for me, it's difficult, man, because I'm not a doctor. I don't want people to listen to the guy for postal, but you don't get the calibre of guests on my show without having big contacts, and my big contacts are, are normally right when it comes to stuff like this, and they believe it's coming from a 5G source. So, I put a post on my Facebook last Tuesday or Wednesday. The UK is going to full lockdown. The army will be patrolling the streets. A lot of people get scared. I think a lot of people. I should have maybe worded that better. I was informed that this would happen, but again, people get scared because that was before it at schools and that shut. I should have worded it better. When people get into full lockdown, it's not a case of you're stuck in the house, you can't leave. You still, pharmacies are the bottom, supermarkets are the bottom. The army will only be patrolling the streets because I've been told the crime rate's going to go through the roof, Paul. People yep. are going to panic. A lot of empty shops now. And listen, if this was 10 years ago when I was still a little fucking tour, I'd be thinking, right, which shops am I going to tan? So I can imagine what people will be thinking. The army's here to patrol and make sure people are safe and not... Because I've seen fucking videos in Greenock and... What Dumbarton I think in pubs and people are out steaming and fighting and that's the wrong thing use your common sense if you're going to self-isolate do it if you're going to go out yourself like I was up the mountains the day myself just clear the head I had to um, but I worded it wrong a lot of people get frightened oh you're fucking conspiracy theorist or why are you trying to scare monger I wasn't doing that I was just trying to give people a heads up but the army will be here to patrol the streets as well but they were doing it so everybody's not out because people are or not, I know the pubs and shit, some of them are open, some people are ripping their ass out of it, but I think that it's a good thing for people to self-isolate. But again, the conspiracy theory shit, I speak to a lot of people and they're saying, when a fucking place goes into lockdown, the numbers go faster and rise faster. Why is that? Why is that like an all-time high, but it's been on the lockdown for the last two weeks? I'm, I'm still thinking about your lockdown, which basically means you stay indoors mm -hmm. for as much as possible and then you go out for the necessities. But if you don't have an indoors, if you're on the streets, what happens to the guys? So yeah. there needs to be mm -hmm. measures in place by uh, our own government to mm -hmm. ensure that these people just aren't forgotten about. I think they will. But again, how's people going to buy food, Paul, if they're not working? Are they going to fund it? I, I know, I think, was it Italy and Spain? They stopped people's housing and gave them free electricity. They need to come with a plan to say, look, you've got free electricity, you don't need to pay rent for the next two or three months. Do you know what I mean? You need to really put people's in thoughts and into your own consideration that they've got the power to do this shit but again you're just slaves Paul you're just slaves man we're just the pawns in their game you're just is this just a, a trial run for what's to come maybe in the next two three years time so we're just a system we're just the rats in the system of their game we're not being taught how to utilise we're in our mindset and if everything does get into lockdown if all the shops are fucking shut how, how can we survive do you know what I mean how can we if we're getting taught to grow our own food if we're getting taught how to do other things. We ain't getting taught that. At schools, we're getting taught to sit at a desk and just crunch numbers and learn your maths. You're taught to use your memorisation. You ain't getting taught to think for yourself. And it, This is what I've started to realise. Wait a minute, I need to start doing this shit then. I need to start preparing myself in case this shit. The world can get turned upside down very fast and this yeah. is what's scaring me the most how fast that people have crumbled. It's a stark realisation. Some of the most enjoyable episodes of your podcast are when you're talking about, and they're called conspiracy theories, simply because they're not confirmed by the mainstream. I mean, the most ridiculous thing in the world is to send tanks and bombs to another country in order to then take ownership of their oil. But that's that's not a conspiracy, that's reality. Mm. right? So if that's reality, how ridiculous is, is a conspiracy? Let's mm. be honest. So you're saying there about a virus being man-made. I think more and more people are starting to 
come round to that way of thinking. We're in a situation where everybody needs to just look after themselves and those close to them. So perhaps we're not able to discuss it as much because mm-hmm. the priority is let's look after each other. However, when you think about the way that governments behave when they want a result, it would not surprise me if, if it has been something that's been placed. And as you say, if it's man-made, then there's going to be a remedy. Mm-hmm. There's got to be a remedy. Some of the conspiracy theorists, as they're called, James, I wouldn't necessarily call them all conspiracists, mm-hmm. that have appeared on your show, David Icke, for example. Um, you've spoken to him since the last time you were on A Celtic State of Mind. Talk to us about some of these individuals that you're meeting. You must go away and then start thinking... Wow, I'm going to do a bit of research or that, mm-hmm. and, and I'm going to read this book, and mm-hmm. um, because they really do just yeah. plant some, you know, obscure yeah. ideas. And I obviously got to research my guest. I don't research too much because I can I try and keep the the interview as raw as possible. But when you study David Dyke and you listen to his theories, a lot of the stuff he says, listen, is right, it's bang on. And he he predicted this twenty thirty years ago. He predicted that viruses to come so people can get microchipped. If you're microchipped and you're controlled where you're paying for your food and all your bills through a microchip, but that microchip also knows your destination as well, so there's no freedom anymore. He talks about, like, your people are queuing up for two, three days to wait for the new iPhone. So if he drills that addiction into the kids, people, the government drill the addiction into the kids from that age, when people go and get microchipped, he says in Sweden they're microchipped now, in some places in Sweden, and he says they were all queuing up to get microchipped or throwing parties and shit. But that's where they're just taking their control. They want a one-world government, a one-world currency as well, where everybody's controlled and the numbers are going, we're over 7 billion now, hitting 8 billion people on the planet. They can't control that shit. The more people that are awake, the more changes that are going to come. The elite who are running this world, there's only a handful of people mm-hmm. who's calling the shots. And it's scary. It is scary to know that how easy it is, though, for the world to get shut down. How it is to, for people to... I was driving along Glasgow on Saturday night and there was fucking nobody about, and yep. it was scary. Mm-hmm. I kind of enjoyed it as well, because I'm thinking, this is so peaceful, but then I'm thinking, the bigger scale that the people are in the house is scared, frightened, worried, but it shows you how much, if you pull the plug on it, how people are easily manipulated as well, and you've got to understand as well, well, the coronavirus is bad, and people are frightened, I get it, but there's more people who die with suicide every day, there's more people who die with homelessness every day, than the coronavirus numbers, so... The corona numbers haven't been massively, I think it's a few thousand people, I don't know the exact numbers who've got, who have actually passed away. I know Italy's really bad just now and I do pray for them, but I'm just hoping that things can change. But again, when you listen to the guys like David Icke, it's mm-hmm. some, it does get you thinking, but I don't want to go down the rabbit hole too much because I've still got to live because you can be fucking paranoid at everything where you start questioning everything. I question everything anyway, and everything is a conspiracy to me unless I see it with my own eyes then I'm always going to be wary. I don't believe what... I don't take everything that David Dyke is true either. He's made mistakes. He says a lot of crazy shit. But he's also said that a lot of stuff has came through and it's it's happened and it's still happening. He wrote these books 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> so even the things with The Simpsons, Paul. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I know. If you want to know the fucking future, just watch The Simpsons, man. It's unbelievable. I watched The Simpsons. The, the film The Simpsons was on yesterday and the girl that I'm seeing, she sent us a picture and it was Tom Hanks that appeared on the film and he was talking about the vi- a virus that was going to shut down the world. And he's just been in isolation there. It's the incredible. Last two weeks. It's incredible. People think Matt Groening's a time traveller because there's so many messages in, mm-hmm. in the episodes down the years, James. It's quite frightening. What I look upon your podcast is I look at you as you're seeking the truth. You're out mm-hmm. there seeking the truth. And some people you speak to might be ridiculed. And I think that's one of the big things about conspiracy theories, that people find it easy to ridicule them. But you're doing the legwork, you're getting people in, you're speaking to them, you're getting their stories. One of the most harrowing one recently was the, the case that, that you were speaking about at Ashton Hall. Mm-hmm. I mean, that I was almost in tears listening to that, yeah. that woman's story. Barbara O'Hare, and she released a best-selling book. The thing with Barbara, she was trying to tell her story for 20 years, Paul, and everybody called her a fantasist. So Ashton Hall was a mental institute, we used to take kids in as young as 12. But what they were doing was drugging the kids. It was a paedophile ring. They were drugging the kids, raping the kids, and even killing them. They were using MK Ultra, which is a source of mind control. But what happens is the paedophiles have got a checklist. So this checklist is get kids who are homeless from a broken home, addiction problems. As soon as they get them in the mental institute, they sign them off as crazy. So when the kids who were running away, scared to tell the police, the police were taking them back there because they were signed off as crazy. They were just making it up in their head. So as soon as you're signed off, nobody believed them. Same as with Barbara. Nobody believed the women. 
until 20 years when she got the concrete evidence and that's when the people start believing her. But again, then, they're dead. So it's hard to get any closure. And for that woman to still be telling her story is unbelievable. 20, 30 years down the line. But kids as young as 12, they were using pregnancy tests for the young girls. The doctors were coming in. Men in their fancy suits, big cars driving up, just having their pick. And I don't, listen, I'm a guy for post, so I'm, I, I don't realise how fucking deep I would go with this mm. podcast game, Paul. And a couple of people says, look, man, don't go down that route, take a couple of steps back. But I can't. Because once already known, if people are here with concrete evidence in their story, then I've got to let them tell it, Paul. Definitely, and it's it's that constant uh, search for the truth, James, and fair play to you for doing it, because a lot of people shy away from that because it's too controversial, mm-hmm. or you might upset their own people, so fair play to you. Some of the, the guests you've come on and allowed them to tell their story has been from maybe the criminal underworld, um, and they get massive, massive hits on mm-hmm. your YouTube channel. What do you think it is about criminality or gangsters, if mm-hmm. you like, that attracts people and, and people want to hear their stories. I think everybody in their own mind, Paul, thinks they're a gangster. I think we've all stood in front of the mirror, kidding on, we're fighting 10 and 20 men. I think we all enjoy those kind of films from Scarface, Goodfellas, The Godfather. I think everybody wants to be a gangster until... Everybody thinks they're a gangster until a real gangster walks in the fucking room. But the things on Netflix itself for me is the crimes, the true crime podcast, the murders, the gruesome shit. In the people's minds, that's what they want to see. So I've got to play the game. You, I bring these guests in, they hit half a million views. That brings a lot of traffic towards my channel. And that means for me to do that, I've got to use my mind. Because when I eventually do get people like Barbara who hair on to tell their story, I've got a big enough platform for people to watch it. So I know these are big hitters. I don't glorify these people in any way. We talk about their life. And you'll tend to see a lot of the big gangsters, a lot of the criminals have been abused or bullied when they're younger. Mm-hmm. It's a defence mechanism. But... I know what people want to see. I'm not daft. I play the game well where I know what guests to get in at the right time at the right moment and people are going to talk. Like likes of Tommy Robinson, you know how much stick I got for that, Paul. I was a Celtic man myself. It's It was difficult to see, especially seeing your own turn against you. But again, I'm only giving people a platform. And I've had fucking Johnny Adair on. Do you know what I mean? Nobody, nobody said anything. Do you know what I mean? Nobody says nothing. But as soon as I had Tommy Robinson, because of the thing in Sunderland, which I, I totally get, I don't agree with a lot of things that Tommy Robinson and even says it on the podcast. We've had many disagreements. But the thing with the paedophile rings and try to expose that shit, and it does take a lot of courage for the guy to go and do that and put yourself at the forefront. Ha, ha, the abuse that him and his family get on a daily basis is unreal. And there's a people who, I, I believe, just gr- groped his young girl there at eight years old in the swimming last week. Right? Yeah, Tommy Robinson attacked the guy. Tommy Robinson got to jail. So guy puts his, he could maybe... Change the way he deals with things as well. Same as they had the paedophile hunters on as well, but who maybe video people straight away. But these guys have had over 100 convictions and every one have been 100%. Mm-hmm. They were paedophiles. But again, could they do it differently with a maybe show the video after it's been done? Instead, they, p- people think they're vigilantes. A snap. You've got to understand these men, if they're not there, then there's over 100 other paedophiles on the streets. Potentially, they've just saved thousands of kids. It's gruesome. It's mm. gruesome to think about it, James. One of the other series of podcasts that you, you've done, and I get the feeling that it'll be ongoing, James, is on the Luke Mitchell case. Mm-hmm. I remember it well because he went to the same school as my big sister and my big brother, St David's, and Dal mm-hmm. Keith, wasn't it? Yeah. So what got your attention of, with that mm-hmm. story? Because you're a wee bit younger than me. I don't know if you yeah. remember it kicking off back in the day. I just remember, the first. my first impression is Luke Mitchell is a fucking, he's guilty, he's a beast, he's a fucking... Everything, and then I says that his mum. I says I've always thought the cunt was guilty. I thought time of day, I just I've never bothered my ass. Yeah, and you're thinking I know they portrayed him as a mad goth and fucking animal slayer and all that shit. But I had Joe Steele on my podcast. Joe spent over twenty years in prison for the ice cream wars. Him and T C Campbell, and it was Joe was on, and Joe says um, uh, Joe was an innocent man. So if anybody's in the notes, Joe. Uh, and he says that there's another innocent man there and he says, look, Mitch, Owen, my, I, I kind of got a sickness feeling in my stomach so I felt, I wish he wouldn't have said that. And he says, it's true, he's in, the boy's innocent. Um, look at his case files. And I end up contacting somebody. I put a post out, actually, about, look, Mitch, was mum, can anybody put me in contact with her? Somebody from Edinburgh. Scott contacted me and said, yes, yeah, there's our details. Um, kind of looked into it, we got the case files and, yeah, there was no DNA. There was six... That's a DNA around the little girl Jodie's body. None was Luke Mitchell's. Um, statements has changed against the boy Luke. Remember, the wee boy's only 14 at the time, and I need to take into consideration that there's an innocent girl dead as well. Do you know what I mean? I understand that the, the 
uh, Jody Jones's family are going through a lot of shit and still to this day. But if that boy's innocent, which I believe he is, Paul, um, for the for what I've seen, and that means there's a murderer on the loose. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not going to step back because I know the shit I've got for that as well. Because everybody, the papers, it was trial by media, so there was no uh, DNA. There was nothing round the body, and I know people say that the mum burnt stuff, but there was nothing. They took the burner away, and there was no sense, mm-hmm. uh, no DNA of anything being burnt. Um, the only things that have been burnt is uh, Luke's mum's caravans. The woman's living in a cold hut now, no electricity, no water. Um, and I can understand if somebody thinks that somebody was a part of killing an eighteen-year-old. They've got rid of his clothing, but that boy can get out of prison. That boy can apply for parole. 17 years later but he's denied it because he wants to walk out there a free man mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so I try to get what actually agreed an interview with look in prison the governor approved it and then something happened then he just pulled the plug on it so that shows me that they're not wanting the truth and the fact that look past a lie detector in prison with Terry Mullins the leading polygraph expert in the UK and Luke's mum passed a lie detector people say he can pass them this and that listen it's, a, it's tough to pass a lie detector but with this guy's Machines, he's got eye recognition in now. And for two people to be lying and pass the lie detectors, millions to one. So for me, that is clear evidence that the boy's innocent. And Miscarriage of justice, yeah, James. But one of the biggest in the UK, I believe, Paul, if it comes to light. But it's scary that this shit happens and it fucking happens. TC Campbell and Joe Steele are prime example. Yeah. That it does happen. The police want, they want convictions. They don't care how they get it. They get convictions, they get promoted. Well, the, the big one from my area was uh, China Johnson. I don't know if you ever watched the documentary about the murder that happened in Milton Green in Dunfermline and um, two life sentences. And it turns out that it was a miscarriage of justice. Um, there was an expose by Mark Daly on the BBC and the two gentlemen, as we'll call them, were released from prison after 15, 20 years. So it happens and you see it firsthand. Dick Monroe was the, the leading officer in that case and he was sentenced to eight years in jail. You know, so we know it does happen. Mm. Other one, Fife based that really captured my imagination was um, you came through about the young boy who went missing after a night out. Alan Bright. Alan Bright, yeah, yeah, yeah. And his dad was on moving uh, testimony from his old man. Mm-hmm. And you just want that guy to get some kind of closure. What was your kind of feeling after that one? Yeah, it's, it's, when I do my podcast as well, Paul, you kind of go home and you're flat for two or three days because it's heartbreaking to see people struggling. And I have a lot of criminals on who've done a lot of bad shit as well. And But when it comes to kids and stuff, that was a young boy who's been missing for six years, body never been found. His dad believes he's dead, but he's never had any closure. Never had any closure to that situation. And he's, the guy's still fighting and it's... It's sad to see when people break down and stuff and I don't think I've cried yet doing a podcast but I nearly cried in that one because it's heartbreaking to see that that man's head must be fucked and I still speak to Alan, he's a, he's a real nice guy and when you hear people tell their stories that to see your son in a, a camera and that's the last you ever see him disappear, it's scary. So it is to see people struggling and, and I met his mom, uh, Alan's uh, junior's mum and that as well and you can see they're struggling but they're still fighting to try and get answers. That's what he says. He says there's no care if anybody gets convicted. He just wants to bury his son. Mm-hmm. He wants to find out the truth. Mm-hmm. Brilliant podcast and really worthwhile. And, and looking at that, I think it re-energised the campaign because after that, I've gone back onto the Facebook page for the first time in a long time after watching your mm-hmm. podcast. Oh, it was close to my hometown, so I, I was aware of the case. You have now about 100 episodes under your belt, am I Yeah, right? coming for 100, brother, yeah. Right, now, what interests me is, sometimes people ask me, who would be the top three interviews, if you could, dead or alive, top three interviews that James English could conduct? That's a good question. People ask me that all the time, but I think they fucking change all the time. I'd love, I just watched a podcast there with Mike Tyson and Eminem, but I like, I've always been a massive fan of Tupac, Elvis, so many greats as well, like Einstein, there's that, it's such a, I'd love to pick the brains of these people because these people at once get called crazy as well and there's just so many different people including yourself Paul as well we can get you on and get your story you're still alive and I just wait till that corona kicks in not me, it sorry. becomes really desperate <laughs> for you James give me a shout um, <laughs> and I'd love um, a two pack if it was still here um, another conspiracy theory right there mm-hmm. have you seen uh, the uh, I watched all that shit oh, on Netflix yeah, yeah. Again, he gets shot in Las Vegas, do you know what I mean? They couldn't even... So again, it's all conspiracy theories. But again, it might just all be true that they just were on your sins and they just get fucking killed or gangs, whatever. But I'd love to have Big Elvis on. 
hear the big man story. I watched the Ray Charles film last night on Netflix as well, which was powerful. There's that many guests, but again, if I was to pick three, it'd probably be two pack Einstein and um, I'd like Tyson on. I believe I'll get Tyson one day, next two or three years, maybe. That'd be great. Yeah, I'll get I'll get these guests on, Paul. I haven't enough says I was on here a year ago, and I haven't enough still says it's still bang on course. Exactly. You know That's I mean? why it's good to come back yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, it's good to come back in. And uh, the other big thing you've mentioned there is the vulnerable in our society in relation to in relation to the current situation that we're in. And one of the most vulnerable groups in society is the homeless. And obviously you yourself, James, made a fantastic documentary, which you can still watch on Amazon Prime. What can be done to help the homeless now more than ever? Once that pandemic starts hitting the homeless, they don't have the same yeah. support network mm. of, of you and I, and it can wipe them out, you know? So what's, what's your thoughts on that? Is enough being yeah. done in the highest yeah, levels? I believe that... If there obviously can be more done in the highest levels, but I've seen London there opened up their hotels, which helped the homeless get a room. We keep them safe, keep them protected, which is an amazing thing. That just shows you how easy it is you can help people. People have got kind hearts, Paul. People, and I see a lot of videos now, people posting videos of doctors from Cuba and India and Pakistan and America, and they're saying amazing because they're going to help Italy and Spain. The world's a good place. Do not forget that these people are helping you from all around the world, but then when other countries go and get bombed, but the British have bombed more countries than any other country in the world. They've invaded more other countries, invaded more countries than any other country in the world. And uh, don't forget that we're all human. Don't forget that people are always coming to help. Don't forget when you see these countries getting bombed, don't not stop showing the videos. Then do you know what I mean? Because they're doing good. There's kids everywhere who are dying every day from catastrophes, and the same as the homeless. There will be a body count will rise massively over the next three four weeks in the UK, but. If you've got a hotel, open spare, make up little survival kits yourself, go into the town, offer maybe a sleeping bag, some food, just do it off your own back, um, because a lot of companies are shutting down now, because obviously they can't survive, people need funding, Paul, to go and help others, I hope that Nicola Sturgeon gets a finger out and makes some drastic changes to help human beings, it's nothing to do with uh, colour, religion, just help other humans, just open up hotel rooms, open up warehouses, yeah. just get fucking beds in it. She doesn't need to be health and safety. There's so much red tape now around things, Paul, and it's difficult, but just use your common sense, man. Just help others, whatever you can. Help the vulnerable to be a better person. If you do good, Paul, you always feel good yourself. And we are still out. We were out on Saturday there, just handing out things before everything kind of went slow. But the numbers, there's not really many homeless in the streets of Glasgow at the moment, which is a good thing. So I'm hoping that, yeah, use your common knowledge that, help others, they've got the power to open up their houses or hotels to let the needy in, and uh, there's plenty of volunteers out there that want to help, I get still messages every day from people, how can they volunteer, so plenty of people want to help, they just know, they just don't know where to start. I mean this social isolation thing is something that we're going to we're going to deal with, I'm pretty sure over the next weeks and months, just a, a wee personal anecdote for myself, James taking out my mum's flowers and card for Mother's Day and leaving them on her front doorstep and then when driving away, seeing my mum at the front window giving me the finger. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers mum, uh, if you're listening. Uh -huh. Your documentary was a massive success, you moved to the other end of the spectrum for documentary number two. Mm -hmm. Can't wait to see it. Mm -hmm. When's it out? Costa Rica. It was supposed to be last month. Mm -hmm. But again, everything's at a standstill. So I'm hoping we'll get it out next month, maybe April. It's I'd, never heard, I'd never heard mm -hmm. of this drug stroke medicine. Ayahuasca. Right? So tell our listeners a wee bit about that. How it got your interest mm -hmm. and then what you did to make this documentary. Mm -hmm. So Ayahuasca, they say, is a plant medicine. They say it's grown for the earth. They say... Well, ayahuasca reconnects you with your soul. They say when you drink this tea, it's got DMT in it, which is the brain releases, the body releases DMT. Um, they say when you drink this, it brings all your fears and anxiety and depressions to the surface and you, you release it. You don't just take the pain of this life away, but also previous lives. Now, I'm drinking drug-free now, Paul, so I was sceptical, but again, I've still got that wee demon in there. I'm going to make a documentary, it's cool. I was more thinking as well, I'm just going to get fucked up over here and it's just an excuse for me to try it. So we arrived in Costa Rica with a man called Jerry Powell. Jerry Powell was a salt his company for 100 million. Um, was suicidal, depressed, drug addict, sex addict. Never happy? Never happy, mate. And then he tried it himself, changed his life and opened this five-star resort in Costa Rica. So I speak to Jerry, he's a fucking great guy, psychopath. 
crazy, but a, a good one at that. Um, so I took the offer. There was a media trade. Make a documentary. We'll let you stay here for nine days. It's a four, It's a five star resort. All the free food. Amazing. The middle of the jungle. I don't fuck it. I'm in, and um, we created it. The first night is you ask the when you drink. You're in this room. It's like a temple. Sixty to seventy different people. You're all dressed in white. I swear to God, Paul, it's something out of one floor of the cuckoo's nest. It was fucking crazy. People who are talking about stars and spaceships and it, it's fucking nuts. But I kind of like all that deep shit as well. Do you know what I mean? As I can interact, I can evolve no matter who I'm surrounded with. I'll, I'll adapt to that situation and amazing people. I met some friends for life. And we, we, you drink your tea as soon as you, ha, you have a first cup. You've got all these shamans and that. They're dancing and there's smoke everywhere. There's just mattresses. It's just mattresses. And I drank it and I thought, this is pish. And then they shout you up for a second cup and as soon as I took that second cup, Paul, man, it's game time. The fucking ceiling opened. And I've seen a lot of pain, mate. I've lost countless family members and friends to murder, mate. So I've seen a lot of bad shit and felt a lot of pain through the whole ripple effect of life, mate. And that's what I felt was if I was in hell. And the shamans would come over to me and say, um, surrender. Because I'm a control freak, Paul. I try and control everything. My relationships, fucking taking ayahuasca. I try and control everything. And he kept telling me to surrender. They say, if you see pain, you need to walk towards it. And I was scared, mate. You're, you're fucking scared because you see things clear. You talking about the ceiling opens, you see snakes. And this is like, I felt as if I was tripping as well, but you do see, you, you see things and you see it clearly. I was in hell and there's a fire outside. They tell you to go and sit at the fire and mention people's names. And my, when you mentioned their names, I seen my ma, I swear to God, mate, I seen my mum. And I said to the shaman, I seen my mum and I seen her crying. She and I just said that she taking on taking her pain away as well because of all the shit she's went through. And this goes on for four days. It lasts for eight hours a session, and then the last session is twelve hours. The last session you ask it to reconnect you with your soul. So with with this what they say or here is when you before you take ayahuasca, the first bit of trauma in your life they call it the split. The first bit of trauma, the soul splits. This is where people do bad stuff like drink, drugs, alcohol, overeating, because you're trying to fill a void. Because the soul's not connected anymore, mm -hmm. but you try and everybody feels empty. So when they say you do this, man, it reconnects you. And you see the world differently. Listen, I'm still in a good place. I was in a good place going, but when I come back, listen, my life's still going good, man. I'm doing massive things, and people always tell me how well I'm doing, Paul. But I don't see it. I'm still the fucking same. Doesn't matter who I interview. Doesn't matter how much money I get for sponsors. How much money YouTube pay. I still feel the fucking same. Ain't James ain't changed. I just see the world differently. I handle situations better, but I don't see the people you're doing massive things. And I get hundreds of messages, man, weekly through every thousands of messages. Sometimes through when a podcast release through every platform, and and I need to be careful because a wee bit of self seeking as well. Where am I doing it for the right reasons? Am I doing it for attention? I don't believe I'm doing it for the attention. I believe I'm doing good things and I'm awakening people to certain ideas and certain visions that you, anything can be achieved. But it's just crazy to think how far I've came for the wee guy I was three years ago, sitting in a crack den up postal, full of Charlie, full of booze, gambling, still in my mom's house, no money, to fucking create one of the biggest podcasts in the UK and travelling the world making documentaries, mate. It's fucking crazy. And on your terms? And on my terms, mate. I don't bend over, I don't lie down for no cunt, I don't take demands. And the people who I went to these ideas with two or three years ago, they says no, they rejected me. Now they're chatting but they don't want me to work for them. But now I've got a wee bit of, wee bit of ego where I tell you, well, fuck you, you had your chance. I'm doing it. I don't need anybody. I don't need anybody to take control or take come in because I don't trust anybody, Paul. So for anybody to come in and tell me to do things differently, it's already working. All I need to do is keep learning myself, keep educating myself. And it's difficult because I can repeat myself a lot. If you're speaking to the same guests, it's it's not as if you're trying to get different stories. It's You're just interacting. Mm -hmm. My brain will only repeat what it knows, so I need to keep educating myself to new things and new ideas so I don't sound repeated all the time, do you know what I mean? So it's different, but listen, man, fucking life's good. I'm doing good things, including yourself, mate. I'm a massive fan of your own podcast and what you've achieved and what you've done and where you're going to go. So well, life's good, man, and I'm looking forward to the future even more. No, I'm delighted to hear it. You're talking there about taking a drug. Every medicine's a drug, you know, and this is the mm -hmm. thing in some are so powerful and so useful. I remember getting a, a presentation from the head of the drug enforcement in Scotland who held up in his left hand a bottle of whiskey and in his right hand a small bag of heroin. And he asked everybody in the room, what is the most damaging? And he lifted up the whiskey and the majority of the people kept their hands down and he lifted up the heroin and most of the room put their hands up. He says, it's actually the other way about. 
It's just that the way, the methods that, that are used to inject that when you mm-hmm. don't actually need it, etc. That's that's the issue. It's a very powerful drug, but the alcohol's worse. Mm-hmm. And this was this was the head of the drugs enforcement in the whole of Scotland. Now, I, I've never taken them through fear, through any number of different reasons. I've never taken any drugs, but I have dealt with people who have taken, and uh, one of the, the scariest types of drugs is hallucinogenics for me, speaking to people who have actually mm-hmm. uh, been damaged by the use of hallucinogenics. So the drug that you took, or the medicine that you took, mm. was hallucinogenic. Aye, aye, aye. Did it open any doors of perceptions that have changed you since the experience? <laughs> I still feel the same. I came back and I was... I had memory loss. I'd lost my memory. They they were telling me that it was spirits cutting out the bad shit. Because what happens, I've seen your own this as well. I couldn't close my mouth. Other people couldn't close their mouth. But they say, see your gums, Paul. It's the most purest thing to your bloodline. It's through your gums. So they say that you hold all your trauma in there. So they say when the spirits come, it's fucking crazy. And listen, the placebo effect's massive for me because you can trick your brain. One third of the people who take medication... Get rid of their disease or their virus through their own thoughts or belief. I had Dr. David Hamilton on my podcast, who was massive on the placebo effect from, like, if you had the flu and us, he had a sugar pill, and he says, this is going to cure you. Because you're already in your mind, that doctor's going to help you, and as soon as you take that, you've cured yourself. So he says one third of people cure themselves with the placebo effect, including people who are going there. People are in the documentary where male prostitutes, cancer patients, suicidal if they're going in their mind that this is going to be... A lot of people is a last resort, man. A lot of people rolling the dice from their last... Have maybe saved up to go and try this because there's no other option. But if you're going with the mindset that it's going to cure you, there's a good chance it fucking will. I was going with that mindset, I'm going to get fucked up here. This is an excuse for me to do this, but I'm also want to open the horizons, meet new people. No matter what I do in life, Paul, good or bad, I always find the positives from it. And I always knew I met some amazing people. There's all the documentaries that people want me now to do in America and Iraq. So it's opened massive doors for me, for the wee guy who was on a fucking reality show in Glasgow, do you know what I mean? So for me it was just, I'm willing to try anything, but I have to be careful because if I'm promoting about self-love and everything's within, no matter what it is, and I listen to Russell Brand speaking about it, he says anything that you take externally, no matter what it is, no matter if it's weed, people say, oh, there's health benefits, there's not. If anything you take externally takes you away from a conscious frame of mind, as a drug, no matter what it is, and I speak about it in many podcasts that I've done, Paul, that scientists did a study, they did a study on the mindset, they rigged the brain up to the computers, they did one on how well how the brain reacts to alcohol, sex, psychedelics and meditation, they gave the brain a mark out of 10 on how it feels while on these things, alcohol got an 8 out of 10, sex got a 9, psychedelics got a 9.5, but the only thing that got a 10 was meditation and breathing techniques, so you can get to these states clearer, higher through stuff that's within. Mm-hmm. The other stuff also gave you a come down. The only thing that ever gave you a come down was the breathing techniques and the meditation. So no matter what it is, no matter, and I know people smoke joints, I smoked weed for 12 years myself, so it was always, oh, it keeps me out of trouble. But it didn't, it made my fucking space cadet. I lost my, when these wee small objects, like my mum wanted me to do something, I would moan and complain. It was massive for me to go out of my bed, so I'd complain, so... If you're smoking weed and that, and we create excuses, we justify everything. But if you're not doing it internally, and if you're if, if it's not making you react to things better and more clearly, then it's not the right thing for you. I know you touched on alcohol there, but alcohol's the biggest drug in the world. It's the biggest drug in the world. It's a depressant. That ain't going to pick your spirits up. Maybe for that three, four hours you're out drinking, you think fucking life's great. But for the three, four days after that, you're going to be depressed. You've spent your money. You've done things that you regret. You must do things naturally. Try and educate yourself. And there's a man called Akala who I used to listen to a lot. He always says that knowledge is power. Educate yourself. Re- re- study, research. Understand that what you're getting taught is maybe a lie. If, if, if you're around Postal Paul, walk down the street, it's a bookies, it's a it's a chip shop, it's a Indian restaurant, it's a chemist. And that ain't going to fucking enhance your career. And if you're surrounded by that stuff, you're going to believe that it's normal, which is scary as well, but... For anybody listening, man, educate yourself and understand that you can make changes, you can make sacrifices to better your life and achieve what you ever want to achieve. You've mentioned in several of your podcasts some of the readings, some of the, the books that you've sought out mm-hmm. as part of your own development. James, is there anything maybe in the next couple of months that people wouldn't have considered previously that they can maybe log on, order mm-hmm. online that might help them mm-hmm. through their own troubles? The power of now was massive for me, Paul. Um my ex-girlfriend got me that book that was about living in the present moment she gave me it as well because I started gambling again I was off everything for nine months 
I started fucking gambling again. She could tell that I was lying. I was getting aggressive. I was getting angry. Something's up. She bought me that book and I just let it sit there. She left us at the deposit for a flat, but I fucking rattled it. Um, she left and I read the book and it just fucking changed my life, man. I just seen... I never read anything, do you know what I mean? I always watch the football, go to the boozers, get mad with it. And then I read this book and it, it totally changed my life. That was a book that changed my life. And then I started doing a wee bit more research about the mindset. And I always say it as well, the brain only repeats what it knows. So if you're in a life of misery, pain, struggle, eating shit, talking shit, you're only going to repeat that until you eventually start making strides. At it. And I do it every morning. I've got affirmations right down on my wall. I'll say you are good enough, good enough, you are strong, you are positive, you are this, and I'll list off. If you keep repeating that, then the brain will repeat that cycle and will start believing it itself. So the power of now made me do all this stuff and also outwitting the devil, Napoleon Hill. He speaks to the devil, the devil tells him how he controls the world. You are what you think of as well is a very powerful book. So many motivational books out there, so many stuff you can you can even listen to on YouTube. Um, inspiration guy called David Goggins as well, big runner. Overweight, wet the Marines. Now the guy's a fit, he's, he's like 20 odd stone. Changed his life. Now he's the fittest guy in the world on the planet. Just changed his mindset. You've got to be a bit psychotic for change as well, Paul. People feel uncomfortable with change. So mm. if you do something differently, the brain will tell you, oh, wait a minute, you're doing something differently. Here, get back into your normal habits. It becomes uncomfortable. And it becomes uncomfortable. And you lose a lot of friends along the journey as well. I've lost many along the last three, four years in my journey. Um, it's not that being bad. People say you forgot yourself. I kind of wanted to forget myself because I didn't like who I was, do you know what I mean? So it becomes difficult and the more success becomes a lot more hatred, a lot more jealousy. Yeah. And I believe I'm a good guy. I believe I do good things. And if people slagging me, they don't know me. Do you know what I mean? I get a lot more love and support than negative comments. But the jealousy that's come in the way the last six months, the last year, man, I've felt it. And I'm, I'm you're like, oh, why? Do you know what I mean? But I'm doing good things. then, But again, that gives me the fuel to kick on. Because I ain't even fucking started yet. Where I'm going to go in this journey is going to be second to none. I want a fucking statue of me in Glasgow, Paul, just uh, <laughs> sitting there with a bow view at me. Just Listen, fuck he's all. I'll put the traffic uh-huh. on and it's heat, uh-huh. right? Mm-hmm. But see see the, the thing that you're talking about there, James, it's true though, because if you were to just take the advice of every single punter from your hometown, let's mm-hmm. just say, you would never achieve it. You Nothing. just would not mm-hmm. achieve it. I'm looking forward to reading your own motivational book mm-hmm. when that comes along as well. Mm-hmm. But I mean there was a, a situation where I think there was a group of guys all came together who since then have and I think you probably already knew Tommy, Tommy Sheridan, but we all mm-hmm. got together to play charity football games. Mm-hmm. And from there I've stayed in touch with yourself, Tommy, mm-hmm. Simon Weir mm-hmm. uh, and guys like that. And it's great to see every single person going and doing their own mm-hmm. thing and when possible, feeding into each other. Mm-hmm. Then we've just heard during this <laughs> this podcast that as of tomorrow, mm-hmm. everybody will be in this lockdown Locked situation. Down. So what we need to try and do is to try and maintain that positivity. And you always are positive mm-hmm. on your podcast, James. So thanks for sharing some of the, the books, etc. Some which I've not read and I'll need to read over the next mm-hmm. few weeks and months. But these games that we played, the reason I did it was just to get a wee bit of fitness back, because you get to a certain age, you get so busy. The gym membership's yeah. long cancelled for me, so <laughs> it was to give me a wee yeah. bit of an impetus to get fit. Uh, how much have you been enjoying the games, and also the experience you and I had about a year ago when we played at Celtic Park? Oh, that's amazing, Paul. Tell you, that's a, that was a boyhood dream of mine, just to always go there and then to score as well. It's, that was a belt. It was a great feeling, man, and I appreciate that call-up and to do that. And listen, it's, it was amazing to walk through the tunnel and... You, you're fi- when you're in the re- dressing room, you, I try to not be too excited, mm. even though you just kind of want to jump for joy. That you're thinking, man, all the fucking greats have, have been in here. Your Larsons, your it's just unbelievable to think that they've been in there. Your Lubos and to walk through there and play. And in my mind, I was visualising a full house. I was visualising I was playing Rangers, even though it was Celtic v Celtic. It's just um, it was a what an experience. And that listen to even do that was to fulfil a dream. That's a, that's a bucket list dream for me, was to play at Parkhead, and I've achieved that. Which is, and I believe I'll play there again, and I know I'll play there again, and this time it will be full. I don't know why, I don't know how, but I will play there again. Well, there was a lot of money raised that day, I think, mm. from uh, Magners, so it was all for a good cause, but you played football when you were younger, you've played in some of these charity games against some really good players. Mm. Who's the finest player you've ever shared a pitch with? Oh... I don't, it pains me to say it, but the, the best player who I've been playing against, especially the old firm games and that, was, was we Alec Ray. 
So it's, <laughs> that's a tough one to say that. I, that's tough. I had said Charlie Miller. I uh-huh. thought Charlie Miller's just uh-huh. unbelievable. Uh-huh. For, about tw- uh, for about 20 minutes, uh-huh. and then he's knackered. Uh-huh. I think uh, yeah, Alex, brilliant, man. Even you, the way he's in the party, he's a dirty wee bastard, but he's, uh, he's just a great player to, to play against Big Marvin Andrews. I know, sorry, the Teddy's I'm shouting, but it's just a big machine. That guy can still play, I think. Big, big Marvin. Marvin. Yeah, I wouldn't just, go for a Do you know what I mean? No. But for me, I, I thought he was brilliant. Uh, so I did. I thought he was really good when I played against him. We Charlie as well, brilliant. Obviously, you've got the Celtic boys, but for me, the, the Rangers players... Don't know, just seem a wee bit more fatter. Sorry, Simon, and that if you're listening. Rudy Vatas. Rudy Vatas. Rudy Vatas. He's a player. he's an angry bastard, big Rudy, isn't he? Literally with nothing. This is shouts. We guys have just paid a hundred quid, hundred and fifty quid to play, and he's slaughtering them. They want to stay in the yeah, changing room at half time. No, it's great fun. Hopefully, we can do it again once mm-hmm. all this dies down, and it seems less important now after mm-hmm. the the recent news um, when we're talking about football. And I think Chris Sutton came out the other day and said that there's far more important things to life. We will discuss it. We're on a Celtic podcast, a Celtic oh. state of mind, James. What do you think is going to happen? I mean, it now looks likely that no games will get played. Yeah. I think they'll get, I think Celtic will win the title, no matter what they do. But for me, if I'm honest, man, that, that would feel tainted for me. That wouldn't feel, it wouldn't feel right because that's never going to live you down if you get 10 in a row and then maybe lose the league again. Celtic would need to go and win it. This would need to be eight again once the season started because... You ain't going to fucking live that down. Imagine shouting about 10 in a row. You know you're going to get slaughtered. And you know what Rangers and Celtic fans are like? It's tit for tat. I hope they do play the games, whether it's in the summer or whether it's in September. I'm sure they could smash out three games in a week and do that for the next two or three weeks. I know the cup games, what I'm hearing is they'll never get played again. But for the league, they will hand Celtic the title, I believe. But it won't feel right for me, Paul. I, I, I wouldn't want to win it that way. I would still want it, but it needs to be done right. Got to play the games. <sighs> it just needs to be done right, man. And Celtic are rightly winners, if I'm honest, but they've, 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 they've no won it yet. So there is a way of doing it, uh, you know, once the dust has settled. My biggest concern now, James, is Celtic are cash rich. They've stockpiled a lot of cash. Mm-hmm. Even if there was no games and no income through the turnstiles for three or four months, Celtic would get through that. Mm-hmm. They'd lose a lot of money, but they'd get through it. Other teams won't. And I think the landscape of Scottish football is going to change forever. Clubs will face financial ruin. Mm-hmm. If that was the case and clubs were unfortunate to go to the wall, not just because it's football, but people are losing their jobs. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the biggest that's the biggest priority. Would Celtic be looking at doing something completely different? Would they be looking at the possibility of moving elsewhere? Mm-hmm. Premiership. No premiership, maybe getting to the third or fourth tier and you're talking about other teams going bust. I believe teams in the Scottish Premiership will go bust. You can't afford to pay players, you can't afford to keep stadiums going and running. So there's going to be a lot of people selling up if this prolongs for four, five, six months, which potentially it could. So it is scary. What would they do? Would they bring in a British league? All the best teams, put them in, possibly. But for me, Celtic's one of the biggest teams in the world. There's no denying that. Biggest fans, best fans in the world for me. But the options are there for Celtic. Celtics, it's the other teams I worry for who are struggling. Teams in the Premiership are already studying, struggling with games getting played. So this is... Massive. This is a financial disaster for the whole world. This economy. This is this has never been seen before. I don't think even the World War Ones and World War Twos. People can prepare themselves. People never prepared themselves for this. For the lockdowns, for the shutdowns, for businesses to go under. People are going to lose their houses. So for me, it's to the, the main priority is to keep people safe first. Football comes second. Yes, we miss it. Yes, it's life's it's pretty dull. We feel it as sad as that is, but we look out for results. But it's we're what we've been grew up with for, for the day I was born, it's been football, 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 man. So it is difficult times, but it's not the main priority. And I hope things do get figured out. That listen, everything will get figured out. Times will move on. We'll look back at this in two years, five years, whenever and go, fuck me, that was a tough time. But this is when you find your two, your true character. And let's see how the government react to helping others. But again, if you want to make change, become the change yourself. Do what's right for you. So for me, Paul. As long as people are safe, Celtic are going to stay strong. And maybe, potentially, maybe get to the English leagues. I believe Celtic will strive. I think they deserve to be in the big leagues. No disrespect to Scottish football, but it has been going under for the last 10 years, possibly. So, I don't know, man. It's a tricky one, mate. We've spoken a lot about your own journey, and thanks for sharing some of the reading material, which hopefully some of our listeners can tap into, James. 
and also your documentary is on Amazon Prime. Mm-hmm. So make sure you go and watch that. That, sure that an hour and a half of mm. fantastic filmmaking by James, and let him know your thoughts on that. What was harder to do, the homeless one or the the medicinal one? Oh, the hardest I journey. I the Ayahuasca one, mate. Right. The homeless one, I found my feet after three days because I knew I was going home. Nearly seven, I knew. I just knew I was going home. So there was people on the streets for 25 years, so I'm not going to complain about... The first night was the hardest when I felt, fuck this, I'm going home. That's just, what am I even thinking about doing? Because I knew I was going to miss Christmas Day, but then I started to hear people's stories. So then I knew what I was doing was for the greater good. And remember, if I'm doing good, then I feel good. So even though I was doing it to try and help others, I was always I was benefiting it no matter what I was doing. And you're always going to get your haters as well who say, oh... He stayed in hotels, he's fucking did this, he's doing it for fame. Trust me, there's a lot more things out there you can do for fame easier. For me, it was no matter what way you look at it, I've done it and it helped people. So I, that was easier, that was easier. The ayahuasca one was painful because I was going on a journey that I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what I was going to take, man. You didn't know if this is a cult. I didn't know what the fuck is this because you're way mad randoms for around the world to are talking crazy shit. And then you get a guy, Jerry Pill, who's a fucking nutcase. So, but also felt home that there as well after a few days. But they the taking the experience and seen a lot of, I seen a lot of family members. I seen a lot of fire and flame. So that was that was harder, mate. That nine days was harder than the seven days homeless. Mm-hmm. I was disappointed when you were talking about the finest players you'd shared a pitch with that you didn't mention our big pal Tommy. <laughs> and if Tommy's listening, then he'll, he'll be very disappointed. Uh, a wee f- word about Tommy Sheridan before we finish. You fuck him, man. <laughs> oh. Bastard! <laughs> I play football with Tommy and I choose to be, I'm a captain in one team Tommy's a captain um, I love Tommy to bitch man he's, he's a fun character and he'd be the first one to help you if you ever picked up the phone to phone him he did his thing man and people forget what he did for the poll tax and that years ago many <laughs> times he's had the jail he's a great guy as much as it pains me he's a good old player in his 70s um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no I love Tommy to bitch man and it's good to see that he still plays in the Celtic through and through, which helps as well. So, no, he's a good guy, man, and uh, hopefully we can share the pitch at Lovins again as well. He's a good player, isn't he? he For is his good. age, man. He's, he's just very fast. Tired, but he's 70 odds. He's, uh, he done his calf there a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it, we've got a group chat for the football on a Tuesday and a Friday, Paul, and somebody put a photo in. No, it's like the nurses standing with, with signs. I'm going to show you. Maybe they'll see it on this. But he's put this photo up, Paul, and he's not. Tommy never seen it. He never seen it, mate. But wait, you see this? Like, I'm not going to discuss what it is, but so he put this photo up. Wait, you see this photo? So he's put this photo up, and he's not even tippled to one of the guys who was in the photo. Um, so that photo there, right? So Tommy, <laughs> he's put that on his Twitter, hasn't he? But look at the guy at the bottom right. <laughs> Look at the guy in the bottom right, he's put that on his Twitter and he got hundreds of it. He's just put that up thinking it's nurses. Um, if we're staying in like, hospitals to help news, please make sure they stay at home. So he's put that up on his Twitter saying, everybody, please follow us. So at the bottom right, we've got a big a guy with his mobile. So um, he's no noticed that, so he had to delete it. It's the eyesight, you know, he's, get, he's getting old. He's getting old. <laughs> and he's put that on his thing, so he had hundreds of messages with you mm-hmm. doing, that's terrible. And he's and somebody screenshotted all his apologetic messages replying to everybody. <laughs> ah, he's a fucking old <laughs> man, that's funny. Pure Tommy. Oh. Listen, you're staying positive, James. Thanks for yes, coming man. in, and we'll do it again on the other side. Pal. Absolute pleasure. Keep fighting, brother. Take Stay care. Strong. Cheers, guys. mate.